Good evening, and welcome to the NALU Academy PNS webinar series hosted by NALU Medical. Today's webinar topic is Topics in Peripheral Nerve Stimulation, Denicular Nerves. We would like to remind our viewers that medical opinions expressed herein are those of our healthcare practitioner presenters. Individual experiences and outcomes may vary. This material does not substitute medical expertise nor replace the review of applicable product instructions for use. NALU is a medical technology company focused on developing and commercializing innovative and minimally invasive solutions for patients of chronic neuropathic pain. NALU's award-winning system is designed to address major unmet needs in the treatment of chronic neuropathic pain and provide a whole new world of opportunities for patients and their healthcare teams. This webinar is one among many complimentary educational opportunities offered through our launched NALU Academy of Advanced Neurostimulation. We strive to provide an institutional curriculum of neurostimulation content for both physicians and APPs, while building a collaborative community of experts to have the necessary dialogues and forward the science. We would like to now pass along our program to our esteemed presenters, Dr. Hathaway, Dr. Latif, and Dr. Shaw. Dr. Hathaway, the agenda is now yours. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to uh, be here. Um, I would like to applaud uh, NALU uh, for developing the uh, NALU Academy and uh, really exposing uh, providers uh, to uh, the NALU system uh, and to the treatment for both peripheral nerve stimulation and spinal cord stimulation. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide, please. So I'm going to be talking about um, the genicular anatomy and the NALU system itself. Um, I have quite a bit of experience with peripheral nerve stimulation uh, over the years, and I can truly say that the technology with the NALU system is far superior than anything else that I've used uh, during my career. Next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about knee pain. And what's interesting is that the numbers I'm going to share with you here, knee pain has been shown to affect over 25% of adults with a prevalence that has increased by 65% over the last two decades. Knee pain accounts for nearly 4 million primary care visits annually. And another category uh, that we might forget about is total knee arthroplasty persistent post-operative pain. And at six months, it's been shown that 21% of the patients can have persistent pain, and at 12 months, 16%. So on average, about 20% of the patients that undergo a total knee arthroplasty can continue to have chronic debilitating pain. Next slide, please. So looking at the anatomy, the anatomy of the knee is quite complex. What, what are the genicular nerves? Well, the genicular nerves are a group of nerves that are made up from the articulating fibers of multiple other nerves, the sciatic nerve, the common peroneal or fibrillar nerve, the tibial nerve, the femoral nerve, the saphenous nerve, and the obturator nerves. Next slide, please. What is the pathology of knee pain? Well, we've already talked a little bit about a failed total or partial knee replacement. Neuromas can develop in the knee. Uh, osteoarthritis, the inflammation from osteoarthritis can lead to compression of the nerves and chronic pain. Mm -hmm. Calcium pyrophosphate deposition, where we get calcium deposits in the joint causing irritation that can lead to inflammation and cartilage damage. The symptoms here are very similar to gout and other types of arthritis. Next slide, please. So this is a very interesting slide uh, here to look at. Um, all of you are, probably have done or have experience with radiofrequency ablation uh, in where we put the needles uh, for radiofrequency ablation, usually uh, near the inferior medial genicular nerve, the superior medial genicular nerve, and the superior lateral genicular nerve. What we can see here is the innervation of the knee joint is quite complex. Uh, you can see in yellow, that would be the superior lateral genicular nerve. In orange, the superior medial genicular nerve. And in blue, the inferior medial genicular nerve. But when we're uh, doing radiofrequency ablation, we very well could be ablating other nerves with other functions. Um, and that's really the nice thing about modulating a nerve as opposed to ablating a nerve. Next slide, please. 
So let's specifically talk about the hardware involved with genicular nerve stimulation and the actual waveforms with uh, available for genicular nerve stimulation. Next slide, please. So here are the components of the NALU system. And there are several uh, components that uh, we have access to. Um, there is a trial lead without tines with four contacts, and there's a trial lead without tines with eight contacts. Uh, Typically, I will utilize an eight contact lead for most of the trials, uh, simply because if you do get migration, this gives you a little bit more leeway uh, with programming. For the permanent implant, specifically with genicular stimulation, I'm going to use the four contact lead uh, with the tines. And to go along with these leads, we have a generator that can take one four contact lead, a generator that can take two four contact leads, a uh, micro IPG that can take uh, one eight contact lead or two eight contact leads. Um, it's important to note the size of this device. Uh, you can see the dime up in the right upper right hand corner. So the micro IPG is about the size of a dime. I often tell patients it's the size of the tip of my little finger. Um, it's a battery free implant. That's how it can be so small, but there is quite a complex microchip folded within that micro IPG. Um, another important uh, thing is this is the only implanted pulse generator that has an FDA approved 18 year service life. Um, with respect to the patient peripherals, uh, the patient will typically get two external battery discs. Uh, these typically last 24 hours or a little bit more uh, while one is being utilized, one is being charged and most patients will grab the fully charged one each morning uh, and put the other one back on the charger. Uh, there is a, program, a programming uh, app that can go on an Android phone or an iOS phone. Um, so that makes it uh, convenient uh, for the patient as well. The actual uh, external battery can slip into an adhesive uh, that fits over the mi implanted micro IPG. Uh, there are three grades of adhesive. We usually start with the, uh, the least stimulating one and that they can, there's three different types. So if a patient does have a problem, uh, they, they can go to another grade. Um, and there's also a, a sleeve that this can be put in as well if a patient doesn't tolerate the adhesive at all. It's important to note that the adhesive that's utilized is very similar to the adhesive uh, with a colostomy uh, bag. Uh, so this is typically uh, very non-irritating. Uh, next slide, please. In terms of what NALU has to offer, um, this is quite extensive. Uh, and if we think about um, spinal cord stimulation, um, often uh, the big companies with spinal cord stimulation, you're glued to one or two different types of waveforms. Well, with, with NALU, um, you actually have multiple different types of waveforms that can be utilized. Uh, you can utilize conventional stimulation. You can use high pulse dosing uh, or low pulse dosing. Uh, ske current steering is also available uh, for spinal cord stimulation. Uh, burst type stimulation is available. Scheduling is a very interesting opportunity with NALU where you can actually give a patient a program for a certain period of time and then alternate to another program uh, for a certain period of time. And then you can have a repetitive uh, amount of scheduling uh, for the patient over a 24 hour period. Uh, you can have combination therapies and paired therapies as well. With respect with, to uh, peripheral nerve stimulation, um, you know, we're really in the infancy of understanding how different uh, waveforms work. Uh, will current, uh, current steering have an effect on peripheral nerve stimulation? Uh, that's something that uh, would be interesting to look into. We can also use ultra-long pulse widths up to 200 microseconds. And NALU actually has uh, its own uh, waveform called post-stimulation patterns that is thought to work on multiple uh, etiologies of pain uh, at the same time. Um, so all of these things uh, can be used to give your patient uh, multiple different options. And another thing I think that's important to mention is if a, if the battery needs to be, if, if the micro IPG needs to be uh, upgraded, this can be done through a software update. So when a patient is implanted with this device, 
Um, unlike traditional uh, implanted pulse generators, this can be updated through software upgrades. Uh, and, and like I said, the battery is FDA approved for a total of 18 years. Next slide, please. So looking at a typical uh, implant uh, for uh, genicular nerve stimulation, you can see here an example of a two lead superior medial and superior lateral genicular nerve stimulation connected to a two lead uh, IPG uh, that's in the uh, superficial tissues of the thigh. So this would be a common way uh, to implant this. There's also another way uh, where you can just do a single inferior medial uh, lead with a single uh, IPG uh, lead contact. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> um, this uh, is just a slide uh, illustrating both the adhesive clip, which can be set over the implanted micro IPG. You can see the uh, small hole uh, within the adhesive clip that hole is gonna be placed right over the micro IPG, uh, and then the battery will stick into place. Um, most of my patients who have lower extremity stimulation are, are going to use a, a sleeve that's wrapped around the leg. And I think that works a little nicer when you're doing uh, stimulation uh, in the extremities. Next slide, please. Okay, I'm gonna uh, turn it over now to Dr. Usman Latif, who's gonna talk about the workup of a patient with chronic knee pain, uh, and also the actual approach for placement of, of the leads. All right, thank you, John, appreciate it. So um, I'm gonna kind of walk you through the roadmap all the way through uh, trial and implantation, and some of the implications around that as you're planning for this. Let's go to the next slide. In terms of indication and presentation, you're looking for patients obviously with chronic knee pain, knee pain that's been there for at least three months and for which you've tried other conservative therapy. Um, you want the pain to be mostly anterior knee pain. Uh, if the pain is primarily posterior, then this may not be applicable, but what you'll find is the majority of uh, pain patients uh, with, cr with chronic knee pain have anterior knee pain. So this is usually your typical patient. Um, this is, could be ideal for somebody who's been through conservative treatment, has had surgery, has failed to have improvement even after surgery. Um, they could be a good patient for this. But often it can be patients who did not have surgery. In fact, they've tried other conservative treatments. They're either not a surgical candidate or don't want to go through surgery. Sometimes these could be patients who maybe are obese or, or smokers, or there's some other reason why they're not a, a surgical candidate, but they could easily be a candidate uh, for uh, peripheral nerve stimulation. So this gives options to patients who have often been told that there's really nothing for them uh, that, to be offered. Um, another uh, in interesting application could be for people who have like cartilage effects from trauma, whether that could be from traumatic injuries or sports or, or so on. Let's go to the next slide. In terms of history, it's pretty straightforward. You want somebody who's uh, had knee pain in the, in the confusion that we discussed and has been through some degree of conservative treatment, including physical therapy and other types of injections or treatments and, and medications. Um, in the physical exam, there's not anything specific that you need uh, to have. You know, in terms of clinical history, obviously you want it to be anterior knee pain. Sometimes they have sensitivity in the anterior portion of the knee, but it's not always present. And so I don't, it's not something that has to be checked off on your list to move forward, but it's something that you should document if it's present. Um, we you know, want to go through the routine types of imaging that you would do to rule out any other cause of pain, make sure nothing else is being missed. And then typically we'll do a diagnostic block. So usually diagnostic genicular nerve blocks are performed um, at least once prior uh, to moving on to PNS. You're looking for at least 50% or more pain relief to be a candidate for the trial. We'll talk about later in terms of insurance requirements and whether or not uh, blocks are always required. Um, insurance does typically require psychological uh, clearance, so all these patients will have to see a psychologist, just like you have for your stimulator trials. Um, and then finally, you just want to make sure there's not any reason why these patients will need to have a serial MRIs of their, uh, of their knees. Um, it is conditionally approved for MRI, but there are some conditions around that, and typically it's not ideal to, you know, to, you're not going to be able to easily do MRIs at the exact location of the lead. So if they need they have this in place, but they have to get MRIs of their brain occasionally. That's not a problem. Um, and so just kind of doing some planning around that, make sure there's appropriate patient expectations. Um, in terms of trial, the, the time range can vary. You know, typically people will do about a week trial. Uh, it can go a little bit longer, a little bit shorter. 
you know, to be honest, as long as the patient has had sufficient enough trial to feel that they have sufficient relief with this uh, and it meets that threshold, then at that point, you can always uh, terminate a trial earlier. Um, and then in terms of implants, it's a, timing just varies. To be honest, there, usually people will wait at least 10 days just because of the global period um, after a trial, but it, usually your biggest limiter is just be how quickly you can get it approved uh, by insurance and then get them on your, your schedule for the implant. But I think it's really important when you're meeting patients for the first time to outline this entire process. So they understand kind of what you're working towards um, and but have a, like a realistic expectation of the, the different steps that are involved in the timeline that'll be there. We can go to the next slide. We used to do a WHERE study uh, as we're leading up to the trial. And so often this can be done uh, after the trial has been done or before, it really doesn't matter that much. Uh, but basically finding a spot where the patient would comfortably be able to wear the IPG, um, uh, wear, the, the, wear the therapy disc over the IPG, and then trying that out. Uh, you know, typically it's good for them to wear it for about a week, and that way they can try at different locations, make sure it doesn't impede their activity. They wanna make sure it's somewhere that they can easily get to and put it themselves. Now, for something like the knee, that's pretty easy. For sometimes, so if you're doing, say, like an occipital stimulator, then it's much more crucial that it's some place where the patient can easily reach around to. Um, the other thing is you want to make sure like it doesn't, if, it, if it's too medial on the thigh, then, you know, it could potentially rub against the other thigh. And so just kind of playing around with different locations, seeing how it fits in terms of the clothes that they wear, the type of activities they do, how they like to sit, if they like to cross their legs, things like that. And this way, the day that they come in for their implant, they'll know exactly where, where they want you to put the micro IPG. Uh, we can go into the next slide. So I'm going to walk you kind of through the technique for placement of these leads. And so um, speaking first about trial and then a little bit different about for implantation. I think one of the important things to, to point out is there's two different accepted techniques for this. And I'll walk you through why both of them could be acceptable, but why I think one of them is preferable. Uh, typically you want to advance these leads kind of to the junction of the shaft and the condyle of the femur. So you'll go in with your needles. Um, if you're going to kind of like the mid shaft approach, which is picture there on the far right of your screen. Uh, you'll enter um, at the mid shaft, go until you hit, hit the shaft and then kind of walk your way down until you get to the junction of the shaft and the, and the condyle. The other approach places the leads more posteriorly and you enter kind of a little bit more anterior on the knee rather than just lateral. And you work your way down uh, from anterior to posterior at a, an angle um, and then place the leads that way. The, the reason that these two um, different techniques exist is because the traditional technique, which would be kind of kind of at the mid shaft, which you see pictured there on the far right, is based on the way that we used to do genicular lower face. It was thought that the superior lateral and superior medial genicular were about at the 50% point on the shaft. And so if we uh, did RFs at that location, people would have ideal outcomes. And then maybe about four or five years ago, a bunch of cadaveric studies came out and kind of changed our thinking around this and showed that the genicular nerves in the superior locations are actually much more posterior. It didn't apply to the inferior nerves, but for the superior ones, they're much more posterior. And so about four or five years ago, I taught actually at ASRA on this exact topic and we implemented the new guidelines. And so because of that, now a lot of people are starting to change their approach. So let's go to the next slide and I'll kind of walk you through how we do this. All right, so typically what I'll do is uh, place the needle on a lateral. Um, and kind of just on the outside of their skin and just envision kind of where I want the tip of that needle to end up and then uh, hold it in such a manner that it's in the same trajectory I'm gonna go in. So for example, like this picture there on the left, that could easily have been a picture that I was doing before uh, we even kind of punctured skin. And then mark somewhere just a little bit proximal to the hub of the needle because you'll probably end up encountering just a little more skin or fat or, or not the exact optimal trajectory. So you'll need a little extra needle. So that's where you're gonna enter. So definitely farther away from your actual target. Then you can um, uh, use local anesthetic along that track, uh, go down hugging the lateral margins of the, the, the shaft and then uh, walking the tip of the needle until it's making contact with the periosteum. And then I just slowly walk my way down as I'm going further and further uh, distal. So you can see there on the right side, that's where I first made contact. And then I'm slowly gonna just make little movements and walk my way down, trying to hug the shaft as closely as possible. 
and going back and forth between AP and lateral. So I make sure I don't end up too far posterior uh, and just make sure I have the right trajectory. And then ultimately you want to end up about where I am there in that picture on the left side. And when you're there, you're going to be pretty much at the junction of the shaft and the, and the condyle. And if you then and, uh, insert a lead and advance it, it will just naturally kind of um, wing out to the sides. So let's go to the next uh, slide here. Okay, so here you can see uh, a uh, graphical representation of this. So on the left, you have your lateral view. You can see we kind of came in at an angle. Um, and then on the right side, you can see how those uh, leads will then just naturally kind of follow the course of that condyle and extend out laterally. Now, the, let me tell you a little bit about the difference between the two approaches here too in terms of nerve capture. With both of these, you should be able to equally uh, capture the geniculonerves nerves as they're crossing over the condyle because both of these techniques, you'll end up with your leads right there. Personally, I think the advantage of using the more posterior placement, so where you kind of start out anterior and angled more posteriorly, uh, is that some of those contacts that are a little bit more proximal may be able to capture the genicular nerve even along the shaft. So it just gives you a little more latitude for playing with programming later and a, a wider or a choice of contact points to stimulate that. Whereas with the uh, approach where you're just kind of coming in laterally and going straight up along the midpoint of the shaft, you may not be able to utilize those more proximal contacts. Let's go to the next slide. So uh, as uh, Dr. Hathaway alluded to, there is also um, a very acceptable approach to place leads at the uh, inferomedial uh, genicular nerve. So the technique is very similar. You're just laying the needle along the lateral aspect of the tibia. In this case, you do want to be about at the midpoint in your lateral. And so you're gonna start out more on the lateral aspect of the knee, really dive in uh, medially to make contact along the periosteum and walk your way down, just like in the other technique. Um, let's go on to the next slide here. And then you can see where you end up with your, um, your uh, leads again. So I think the biggest thing here to kind of get your kind of pretty pictures here is just to make sure you make contact with the periosteum and then just slowly walk your way down, hugging as close as you can to the shaft. And then your leads will come out um, just along, uh, just like this. The other thing is to kind of stop right as you get to the junction of the shaft and the condyle. If you get really close to it and then stop, it's gonna be much more likely that the lead as it kind of comes out, just naturally extends out and flails out like it, like it should in that case. Uh, the other thing is just like with, you know, we have lots of experience with stimulators, all of us probably this call. Um, so you want to use that same technique when you're removing your needle. So put low dose, pulse fluoro, go live, and then just kind of put a little bit of forward pressure on the lead near the hub of the needle as you're uh, pulling it out. So you maintain that position. Okay, we can go to the next slide. So in terms of superior versus inferior medial geniculonerves, nerves, they're both acceptable uh, techniques to use. Uh, you know, there's pros and cons of each of them. Uh, for inferior medial geniculonerve, nerve, one of the pros is you only have to do one lead. Uh, then, then it connects to your micro RPG, which you would then probably place on the back of the cap. You're never going to run leads across the joint line. So it's not necessarily a good idea to say, well, it's all medial knee pain. Let's just do severe medial and inferior medial. Because if you run uh, leads across the joint line, there's going to be multiple issues with that, including the migration. Um, if you do superior genital nerve, you're going to place two leads. Um, you know, potentially one benefit of that could be if you had migration of one of those leads, you could still stimulate at the other one. Uh, and in this case, you usually will place the micro IPG along the anterior thigh. All right, can you move on to the next slide? So again, you know, in terms of planning for the implant, really make sure you talk to the patient about uh, doing the wear trial, make sure they find a good spot for that micro IPG. The different ways they can wear it um, that can be decided later. You know, you can use that adhesive. There's um, kind of like spandex pads or like um, uh, binding binders that you can use. Uh, the kind of things that you use for workouts, where you put your iPhone on your on your uh, biceps, things like that. There's a whole bunch of different ways that they can use it, and they can decide that later. They can actually switch back and forth between different uh, methods. But really, the most important thing is where is that micro IPG going to sit? Um, once, when they come into pre-op, what I like to do is to have them be kind of at the end of their wear trial. So they've now found the perfect spot. And then as I go to consent them and I mark, I go ahead and just draw a circle all the way around that disc. And then I fill in that little circle that's in the middle though, the cutout. Uh, the reason I uh, kind of black that out with marker is just as there, as you're prepping your patient, a lot of the marker will kind of get wiped off. But that, if you've really filled it in, there'll be enough of that remaining that it'll be very obvious where you want to put the, um, 
uh, micro RPG. Um, and then the other thing is just to kind of think about where you're uh, entering with your leads, where you're placing them, where you want the IPG to be, so that you can tunnel appropriately to that site and figure out where you want to put your excess lead. If you want to make a little side pocket uh, to put the to to coil some of the leads near the same at, at the same site where you made your nick to place the lead um, at each of those sites, that that's reasonable. Or placing it on the distal side of the uh, nick that you use for the micro RPG. All right, go to the next. So there are a few things that you need to keep in mind in terms of getting these approved for your patients. Um, there is not no NCD for this. So what that means is there's not any national determination for Medicare, but there are uh, local determinations, so LCDs. There's one. Uh, it's from Noridian, which is covering kind of more most of more of the Western uh, US. Um, we're not gonna get into it right now, but you know, there's some others under consideration by some of the other MACs. But right now, this is the only one that's out there. So for Medicare patients, especially in the, on the West Coast, these are the requirements that you need. You need to document chronic and severe pain for at least three months. It's always helpful to document that it, you know, if it affects the quality of life and how it impairs their uh, activities. You want to document failure of less basement, invasive treatment modalities and medications. So you know, have they tried injections? Have they tried uh, things like, say, Synvisc? Um, have they had surgery previously? Have they tried different kinds of medications? Have they done physical therapy? All of that, kind of getting that all lined up and really well documented, particularly in the final note you write before uh, you actually order the, the trial, makes it much easier to get it approved. Um, you always want to have a good discussion uh, with the patient. There's a lot of really great tools uh, that now we can provide you, including like little micro RPGs that they can, you can put in their hands, so they can hold them and feel them uh, and, and see kind of the exact size of them, which I think makes it a lot easier to understand. And I think really uh, emphasizing the decoupled nature, the fact that the micro RPG and the battery are separate, so you don't have to have a big generator uh, in, in your body. Uh, you want to document there's no active substance abuse issues. Uh, like all uh, STEM these days, you have to have formal psychological screening. Uh, there's multiple ways to do that. You know, we have in-house uh, uh, pain psychology actually in our conference of pain clinic, and we actually hired a second one now. But they're so busy that people were booking like four months out, and so we finally came up with a, a deal with them that we now use a telehealth uh, psyche valve that can get people in usually within a week and get us a report within a few days after that. So usually within ten days we have our report, um, and what we do is we just monitor kind of our in-house professionals, and anytime. If they feel like they can get people in within weeks, you know, two or three weeks, then we'll switch right back to them. Until then, it seems like they're kind of busy enough, and this way we can keep our flow moving. And then finally, in terms of this, after the stimulation trial, we really need to make sure you document again that you had at least 50% reduction in pain intensity. Uh, and then I find it helpful to document other things that they may have mentioned, you know, if they were using less pain medications or if they had increased activity or kind of their thoughts on it. Um, the other thing that I think is just a kind of a fine point, but Often these, uh, when they come in at the end of their trial, they may be seeing your, your NP or your PA, and they'll just put some very generic uh, diagnosis and write this tiny little note because it's not a billable note anyway uh, for this procedure. But uh, often insurance will look at that and they care about those diagnoses. So I, we really try to make uh, sure that on our post um, trial visit, we put in the same diagnoses that we used for the trial. Next slide. All right, I will now pass it off to Dr. Eric Shaw, who will talk to you about some interesting case studies. Uh, thank you, Dr. Latif. Uh, I appreciate uh, Dr. Hathaway and Dr. Latif uh, queuing me up with their, all their fancy slides. Um, I just wanna talk about um, why I got into peripheral nerve stimulation about five years ago and why I think it's such a valuable tool for our patients. Um, you know, we have a lot of patients that get blocks and maybe radio frequency and they're helpful, but either at some point they stop helping or they stop helping for as long, or they're really not dramatic and they're on this round robin where you're kind of, we're kind of chasing our tails with different targets. Um, and spinal cord stimulation may seem a little bit overkill. So there is this sort of empty void, if you will, in treatment paradigm where patients were still having pain, but you know, some of us that prescribe medications, including myself, 
I don't necessarily feel comfortable all the time with all patients, and I definitely think opioids should be minimized. And so PNS provides this great filler or option for patients that don't really need full SES or don't have great anatomic targets for pain for SES, but yet conventional treatments have failed. And I'm definitely using PNS more early on now because I've seen such success with it. Okay, next slide, please. Positioning the patient's uh, knee. A pillow underneath the knee is not necessary, but it's definitely helpful, um, especially when a patient is supine. The knee can kind of flop into internal or external rotation, and that can give you a little bit uh, of a difficult anatomic pathway. So having the knee flexed a little bit flexes the hip, of course, and that will lock it in so it's a little bit more uh, fixed. Okay. You do want to mark out the trajectory, as Dr. Latif pointed out. Um, you can do that in your mind's eye. You can do that with a pen. You can do that with a needle. Um, it just depends how comfortable you are and how, how many times, how, how comfortable you feel driving it. There are some arteries and some veins there that you can disrupt. So there can be some bleeding. So um, we, we talked about this before. Um, but in general, with this specific anatomic target, blood thinners would not need to be held. Um, Dr. Latif and Dr. Hathaway and I did discuss this before. We all use preoperative antibiotics, but not postoperative antibiotics. So um, it's maybe a little bit more true with a, a little heavier patient because, uh, of course, they're going to be more at risk for uh, infection. Lead anchoring. So for the trial itself, um, I, I just anchored to the skin with a stay fix and an off site and then a metapore over that. So it's pretty well secured. You do have to be very thoughtful and careful when you between the time you take the needle out and you tether it, because if you're not using a timed lead, especially the eight contact untimed, which the other gentleman discussed, gives you much more flexibility for programming and to find your anatomic target and best stimulation during the trial. Um, they are prone to, to move a little bit when you take the needle out before you've got it anchored. So you do, this does take a little bit of experience and practice to do. And so the needle and the lead delivery, you can put the needle tip where you want the cont first contact to be and then withdraw the, the needle from it. Or you can do like Dr. Latif does and um, push the needle down to the periosteum and then drive the lead out along the, the contour of the of the periosteum there. Okay, next slide, please. So here's a couple of patients that I did. The first one is a 50 year old gentleman. So this multi-ton I-beam fell out of the, he's a welder for, uh, I don't know, most of his life actually, over 25 years. And I-beam fell out of the warehouse sky and basically jumped out of the way and the shock wave threw him 20 feet into a, a storage cabinet and cut off his legs um, below the knee. So transtibial amputation, okay? So he has a very short residual limb, about five inches, maybe maybe a little less than that. Okay, so I first saw him about a year after his injury. Uh, I said, well, let's try some PRP and see if that's gonna help. At that time, his residual limbs were changing in size, so he was having multiple fitments. So I did the, the PRP and then an the orthopedist decided to do a steroid injection, basically negating the effects of the PRP that I had done. So I said, well, let's just do hyaluronic acid and should say genicular, not vehicular. Sorry about that. Um, nerve blocks, and we did those times two, and then we proceeded to RF. So we, we were on the round robin kind of uh, protocol where every three months he was getting one of the other blocks and they were helping. He was much more mobile and getting around better and able to use his prosthesis and walk around, but his balance wasn't great. He needed help standing up from a seated position and um, really doing, doing fine, but not as well as obviously we had hoped, but given the severity of his injury, uh, it's not, it wasn't doing un unreasonably well. So we decided to try Nilu just a couple months ago um, because I thought, well, why are we, this is, this is gonna be for the rest of his life, right? He's 50, he had stopped smoking. 
um, through my encouragement and we're going to my exercise program and trying to really improve this quality of life. And uh, I said, why are we going to we do it every four times a year? We're going to be doing something. Let's let's think about something that's going to be a little bit longer lasting. So he had about a pain five to six. This was with the rest and minimal activity. Uh, he had a four day trial. So, you know, you could go longer, you go seven days. So in general, I'd like to keep my percutaneous trials less than seven days just for that infection risk control. Okay. He noted a hundred percent relief. He was able to stand up from his wheelchair without any help. He put it on his prosthesis and was getting all over with good balance, doing things that he wanted. He lives out in the country in a, in a manufactured home. And so he's got a lot of uneven ground around him and he was walking and not falling, not using crutches. It was very amazing, very amazing result because I don't, you know, I'm a physiatrist and I know that we all look for overall um, improvement with our patients, but I'm very fixated on function and quality of life um, as a, as a marker of successful treatment. As Dr. Uh, Hathaway told us, we don't know yet what current steering and multiple different stimulation paradigms and the optionality of having all these different contacts will be, but we have the technology and the ability as the evidence comes out to essentially do any of that with this device. Okay, next slide, please. Okay. So here's, uh, so that gentleman did not have a knee replacement as stated because he was not a surgical candidate. So this is a lady that had had uh, two knee replacements, a redo by a prominent orthopedist in town who specialized in complicated redos here, uh, here in Atlanta, North Atlanta, uh, just uh, about a year ago now. So no improvements despite, and then I had multiple interventional treatments, including, well, genicular radiofrequency. Okay, by another provider. Okay, and then she came to me. I saw her in April and I said, listen, you've already tried all the stuff that I would do. Let's do the non-lupropanol stimulator for you. I think that's the right thing. She looked at it, she agreed. We got her set up for a psychological screen and proceeded with trial just a month later. So like Dr. Latif, we're, we're pretty lucky in the, you know, Shepherd Center in Atlanta is, you know, we treat spinal cord and brain injury. And I do outpatient pain there. And we're uh, pseudo-academic. We have a lot of Emory PMR residents that come through and rotate with us. And we're definitely an academic institution, but we're built like a not-for-profit private practice hospital. So um, we're lucky enough to have a pain psychologist within our pain center specifically, which is a little unusual in private practice. And uh, she gets busy, right? So she was able to see this patient but like Dr. Latif, we have turned to the telehealth and the turnaround time is quite good. So I do echo that that's for your patients that you're not really concerned about and the screening history on psychosis, depression, suicidality, things like that come up very low. Okay, she did have some bleeding at day three. I brought her back into the office. It looked fine. It was a little tender, but it was but it didn't look infected. I went, uh, trial went to day seven. She had 65 to 70% improvement, but the medial lead was painful for her. And that's where the bleeding had been. When I took the leads out, it was clearly had cellulitis and I was quite worried about it because of the prosthesis. And so I treated it pretty aggressively with oral bactrim. I got a scan. There was no fluid collection, no, no abscess or anything that appeared. But it cleared up after about, you know, it did take a little while, three weeks. And uh, she was asymptomatic, but she said, you know what, I, I don't want to go forward. Okay, so um, so both so both these patients did have prophylactic antibiotics. So I used two grams of ANSEF for the ASRA and NANS guidelines, and I guess ASPN too. Um, but maybe I didn't use this appropriate uh, technique for prepping. So I, I would recommend everybody treat this as a significant implant, both for the trial and, and the permanent, um, even though it's peripheral. Obviously, the consequences are much less than a spinal infection and obviously no, no long-term harm to her. We, we ended up doing a genicular RF on her and I saw her back and she's doing a little bit better. Okay, next slide, please. 
So um, I, I think that what Dr. Hathaway and Dr. Latif mentioned about the anatomy and atomic targets having the optionality of multiple leads and contacts, I'm sorry, multiple contacts, I think this should move up in your thought process for treating patients given its robust effect. And now we'll, we'll open the floor to questions. Okay, hello everybody. If if you have questions, uh, feel free to put those through. Um, we've already answered a few. Um, uh, until then, um, I, I think one interesting uh, area to talk about a little bit is length of trial, and Dr. Shaw already answered that uh, for him. Um, I I I typically do a seven to ten day trial. Uh, technically, NALU is approved for twenty eight days for a trial. Um, I rarely go above seven days, um, and uh, sometimes I'm more in this five to seven day range. Um, I want to make sure that someone has a robust response before I uh, remove the leads uh, in and the trail, and the trial. Uh, what 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 do you do, uh, Dr. Latif? Yeah, so I, I would say similarly. Um, you know, most of ours are just automatically scheduled to be about seven to ten days, somewhere within that range, just based on scheduling. Um, I think that's enough time that they should get really get comfortable with using it, try out different programs and make sure they get good capture. But honestly, I, I find this to be a little bit of a different experience than doing spinal cord stimulation, where you have to do a lot more programming, a lot more adjusting, sometimes the leads migrate, you're looking at different contacts, things like that. I, I don't find that to be the case so much here. I, I feel like really, for the most part, within the first couple of days, we already have a really good sense of uh, how the patient's doing. And you know, most of the time, it's kind of a home run. Um, and so I think it's reasonable even to do a shorter trial. Uh, so if, if a patient calls in and says, hey, it's uncomfortable, or you know, this is great, I'm ready, I want to move on, I think it, it'd be okay. But yeah, I don't think that there's a lot of uh, instances I've encountered where I've needed to extend the trial. I think, I think another interesting thing uh, to comment on is, uh, you know, how, how, do, how do we get these patients in? Uh, one, um, I think if you look at your chronic pain patients in your practice, you're going to find quite a few patients who have chronic knee pain, uh, if you ask. Uh, the percentage of patients that have actually had a total knee arthroplasty in my practice are uh, actually pretty significant, and a significant amount of those have chronic pain associated with that. The other thing, though, that I think that's important to mention is doing outreach um, and going out and doing a lunch or a dinner in the community uh, and inviting orthopedic docs who specialize in uh, total knee arthroplasty and uh, knee pain. Uh, e even There's even patients out there who aren't candidates for total knee arthroplasties uh, that have chronic pain. So I think by doing a little bit of uh, marketing and outreach, um, I, I think that can be a good idea. Uh, Dr. Latif, uh, any, any comments on how you get patients uh, for this indication? Yeah, I, th I think I'll just kind of uh, reiterate kind of on that, that it, getting these patients from orthopedics is really kind of your easiest thing. Uh, the patients that you're looking for, they're not patients you're competing for, they're patients who they've already seen, they've tried to help them, and it was not successful. Those are not patients that the orthopedists want to see. They don't want to keep seeing the people that they could not help and don't have anything else to offer. Those are not the patients that the primary care physicians want to see because they probably don't want to prescribe for those patients. So I think it's actually a very easy case to make to orthopedics and primary care physicians that, hey, all those patients that you have where they've had surgery and they're not doing well, we have something for them that will actually help them. And so I think that is, is pretty easy and low-hanging fruit in terms of getting referrals for this. The other thing I think in general for all of your NALU PNS patients is just if you can do any kind of even rudimentary searching in your uh, EMR, just find all the patients that you've been doing any type of, you know, if you're looking for uh, this, who are you doing knee injections all the time on? Uh, you know, if you're looking at some other indication like occipital nerve, who have you done lots of occipital nerve injections on? You have all these patients in your practice. And I think one of the biggest things you'll see as you keep using uh, uh, NALU is that you have infinite possibilities of what you can treat with peripheral nervous uh, stimulation. And you start with these basics and you get really good at it, but then you can apply the same technique to many different applications. And I, I think that's one of the, actually, the th things that I found to be most um, enjoyable about this is just any, any kind of patient that I have that has reached a point where we don't really have anything to offer, we can often find a neurotarget for them with PNS. 
and then give them a, a good outcome. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, no, I think that's right. And the form factor of the micro IPG is so small. It's not cumbersome like the conventional SCS battery pack. And, and uh, you know, a lot of those things are very sophisticated and have a great deal of computer power. But a lot of people aren't going to have something like that implanted on their thigh or their shoulder or their chest, right? So this gives just a great deal of optionality for anything because it's just such a small thing. Dr. Latif, can you talk a little bit about uh, whether you think a uh, nerve block is required or not prior to going on to the trial? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, you know, it's something that's not really that subtle, even in terms of insurers. Uh, a lot of commercial insurers may require it. You know, some of the LCDs might require it. Some insurers don't require it at all. Um, I think it's, from my own personal perspective, I think it's a good practice to try that uh, because it helps make the case uh, if, it, if it does help. So it also kind of gives the patient kind of a preview to what the trial would be like. It is not, however, you know, there's no, there's no evidence that shows that a nerve block replicates what PNS does. And if you think about it, that, you know, a nerve block is taking something away. Neuromodulation is kind of adding something. And so from that same perspective, I, I kind of think of it kind of like nerve conduction studies or EMG. It's really helpful if it finds something, but if it doesn't find something, that doesn't really tell you that much because the sensitivity is not necessarily perfect. And it's the same thing here with nerve blocks. I think that if you do it and they have really good results, document that, use that to help build your case for insurance. But if it doesn't, and the insurer allows you to do trials even without nerve block, it's very reasonable to proceed with uh, a neuromodulation trial. And a patient very well may have really good results uh, despite perhaps not even responding to a nerve block. Yeah. I kind of think about it like a triple phase bone scan. If it's positive, you got CRPS, but if it's negative, doesn't mean you don't. All right. Well, I'd like to thank everybody uh, for joining in. I'd like to thank Dr. Latif and Dr. Shaw for joining me. It was really great to hear their perspective on this. Um, I would encourage you uh, to uh, consider peripheral nerve stimulation of the genicular nerves for your chronic uh, knee pain patients. Um, if any of you have any further questions, you know, please contact NALU and they can put, us, put you a hold of any one of us uh, and we'd be glad to interact with you on a one-to-one on a -one, uh, level. Uh, thanks again. Thanks so much. Good night. Thanks for joining us. Appreciate it.